Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Ham Nation is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash hamnation. And by DX Engineering. DX Engineering offers practically everything you need to outfit your shack, plus the fastest shipping in the industry. In-stock items ship the same day, Monday through Friday until 10 p.m. Eastern. For more information, visit dxengineering.com slash hamnation. This is Ham Nation, episode number 184 for February 18th, 2015. A cold day in hell, Michigan. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Ham Nation. We've got a good show for you tonight, as always. Over to my west, we've got our good friend from Costa Mesa, Gordo. Hi, Gordo. What's going on? Well, everything is great. And to our east... The latest January-February issue of CQ celebrating 70 years. So it's been a little rough for magazines, all of them, but CQ is hanging in there, and they're soon to get back on schedule. We had Don Arnold, W6GPS, out here, and Don turned me on to remotehams.com. That's plural, remotehams.com. What a great way to test your own signal by logging on to someone else's remote uh, via your computer and hearing your voice come through. Uh, let you really do on the air checks. And finally, George, um, from uh, Dan, WA5CYR of the uh, Tupelo Amateur Radio Club, he says next Monday is the North Mississippi Medical Center location for the uh, valuable Memphis National Weather Service Tornado Watch event. Uh, so if you want to become a certified tornado spotter, um, then uh, check in to this coming Monday, February 23rd. It's at the auditorium of the North Mississippi Medical Center. And may you not have any tornadoes, any of you folks to our east. All right, George, back to you. Oh, well, thanks, Gordo. And just to mention it, I'm going to be in Orange, Texas at the Orange Ham Fest on February 28th. I'll be speaking that morning uh, at the convention center there. Looking forward to a big time, so I hope that some of you will join us there, especially if you're down in the area. Come on by. It's a really good ham fest. And down to my south, we've got our Mardi Gras friend down there, Don. Hi, Don. Hey, George. Happy Mardi Gras to everybody. Of course, Mardi Gras was yesterday, but uh, I'm still kind of... In the spirit, of course, you know, you live around New Orleans, it's, it's always a, a state of mind and a state of being. Yeah, and if you've never, if you've never done a Skywarn class, whether it's in Mississippi or, or anywhere else, you should definitely do that. That is just some, some awesome stuff. I grew up in Oklahoma, so I got a crash course in that from a very young age. But I, I am a certified Skywarn watcher, and I'm also certifiable. But that's a whole different thing. Speaking of weather, we're going to have Dr. Tamitha Scove with the solar forecast tonight too coming up a little bit later on in the newsline piece and also some interesting news about the young ham of the year award we'll get into that a little bit later on too george okay don double certified there wow well we've also got joe mesh with us tonight and he's going to be in in a little bit uh, with another video segment here but say hello joe well hello hello to everyone watching and uh, sure a pleasure to be back uh, good to hear everybody on tonight Nice and cold in Michigan tonight, by the way, gentlemen. With the wind chill, it's well below zero. Oh! Boy, that, that is a cold day in hell, huh? Yes. Yes, sir. Better you than me. Uh, hell, Michigan, by the way. I'm not, yeah. I'm not cursing. It's my you. home QTH, yeah, exactly. My home <laughs> QTH is hell, Michigan, and uh, that's what George is referring to. Yeah. Uh, I, I know it's a, a cheap joke, but, hey, I had to try it at least once. Well, Gordo, I know you've got something special this week. Tell us about it. Well, let's see. This weekend, I'll be at the Yuma Ham Fest on the 20th and 21st. That's going to be a fun one. And then Plano for the Ham Radio Outlet Grand Opening on March 7th. 
and then Palm Springs baking myself on March 14th. But let me tell you, we have a great report from Don Arnold, W6 GPS, that attended the Orlando Hamcation. So, Brian, if you want to go ahead and roll it, he did this just for Ham Nation. Hey, this is Don, W6 GPS, and we're at the 2015 Hamcation. And we have with us here, tell me who you are. My name is Peter Myers. And what hey, do you do? Uh, I'm the Hamcation chairman. And how long have you been doing this, Peter? Seven years. Seven years. Yeah. All right. What can, what, why, do you, why do we call this Hamcation? Well, it was uh, from our grandfathers, and they started the show in 1946 because it's the 69th show. And it was uh, two words in one, Ham Show and Vacation, because this is Florida. Uh, we are on a yearly base growing uh, between 12 and 13,000 now. Okay, Peter, thanks a lot. And there you have it from Peter, the chairman of the... 2015 Hamcation, and we're just going to give you a snid bit here of what's going on at this wonderful show in Orlando, Florida. So let's roll that stuff music. My name is Jeff Keating. I am W4TEK. This is the W4TEK Tech Wagon. It was designed for training, education, communication, to uh, teach young students, kids, Boy Scouts, as well as work in an emergency situation. It's a fully redundant system with two full stations, HF, VHF, UHF. Fully self-contained and will run for about four days on its own. seen some of the old stuff. Let's take a look and listen about some new stuff. Good morning from Orlando, Florida, home of Hamcation, Ray Novak N9JA. Our new toy for this show is the IC7850, our 50th anniversary high-end radio. These things are limited edition. While there's 150 global, we're only going to see around 40 to 45 units. So looking to get one? Get in line real quick. Good morning. My name is Franco Milan from Elad in Italy, and we are here to present one of the latest software defined transceivers, the Elad FDM Duo. 
The FDM Duo receiver section covers 9 kilohertz to 54 megahertz and all amateur bands 160 through 6 meters. It can be operated on a standalone basis or it can be computer controlled. The system features four receivers and a 5-watt QRP transmitter. Everything is fully integrated and is in compliance with FCC requirements. Information about all ELAD products, including the FDM Duo, is available from our website, www.eladshop.com. My name is Chris Wilson, N0CSW. I'm with the ACU USA, and I'm here today to introduce you to the FT991 all mode, all band digital HF radio. This radio is equipped with a capacitive touch screen, many features such as an automatic antenna tuner, in internal and integrated into the unit. Uh, we've, been, we've gone to IFDSP instead of AFDSP, which was in the FT897. So this is an upgrade to the FT897. This is not a replacement. This is our new flagship all-mode, all-band radio with a very, very nice touch screen that allows you to easily navigate through menu systems, switch modes, switch bands, and tune the radio. So we have a lot of features on here. It's like having a full suite of buttons right on the front of the radio. For more information on this radio, you can visit yesu.com and uh, look up all the specifications and features. Hi, I'm Bob Hardy from Expert Linears. America, and this is our new product, the 1.3 KFA SPE Expert Linear Amplifier. It's just been introduced. This one will hit 160 through 4 meters, actually. It comes supplied to where if you have the ex exciter, it'll hit that band, including 60 meters, 6 meters, 4 meters, 160 through 4 meters, give you 1,300 watts, guaranteed on all bands up to, six, up to 10 meters, and six meters a little less and four meters 700 watts. Built-in power supply and everything. It is fully solid state. Automatic antenna tuner comes without the antenna tuner if you want and we have special ham pricing which we will honor if you see this on Ham Nation. Thank you and have a good day. Hi, I'm Eric Swartz, WA6HHQ from Ellacraft and we have the K30 Mini uh, control head for the K3 for remote control over the internet and we're actually controlling it through the remote HAMS software interface written by Brandon Hansen, who's one of our engineers at Ellacraft, and that's uh, remotehams.com. We've got a K30 Mini currently controlling my station in California, and I can actually real-time, as you can hear some audio there, I'll keep it down low, actually real-time control that radio and tune the station in and have full control of the remote K3 of every function, bandwidth, adjusting everything on the radio. So basically, you've got a full real-time, real-feel remote control radio for a system. So how's the popularity of remote hams? Oh, remote hams has just exploded. We've got a tremendous number of people running remote hams with our products, the Ellacraft K3 and the K30 Mini. So it's, it's, it's been a great, great relationship for us. And Brandon, both being one of our key engineers and also the author of remote hams, just does a great job. Oh, man, if you want tubes, they got tubes here. They got all sorts of tubes. You know what? I think I need one of these for my radio <laughs> so I can really get out, really get out with that one. So, we're off to go see some more stuff. Well, there you have it from Orlando Camcation 2015. On behalf of Bruce, W6SFG, my cameraman, and my Elmer, this is Don, W6GPS for Ham Nation, and back to you guys. Wow. Well, thanks, Donnie. That was a fun tour. Thanks, Bruce, for doing the video. And, uh, George, what a great time it looked like everybody had in Orlando. So I'll give a full report of uh, what's new in Yuma next week. Plus, we'll talk about the many ham shows coming up in March that folks have sent me info on. Back to you, George. Cordell, you know, it looked like Don was just having a little too much fun to me. What do you think? Uh, he really does. In fact, when he showed me remote hams um, over here, it was so neat because I could test and see my uh, signal uh, from uh, Bruce's location 20, uh, uh, 2,000 miles away. Neat stuff. He was having fun.
Yeah, boy, these uh, web receivers and radios are really nice to let the guys who who don't have antennas or just want to get on the air from somewhere different an opportunity to do it. And like you say, listen to your own signal to see what you sound like. Well, let's bring in Joe Mesh now with another video here. You know, Joe, last week you showed us a little bit about some of the ditch, uh, different digital modes there. What have you got this week? Well, thank you. Thank you very much, George. Uh, a little more on the same. Uh, we're going to talk a little more about programming radios and programming D-Star radios in particular. Boy, I enjoyed Gordo's uh, uh, presentation there, and uh, I couldn't help but, but remember as I watched the uh, presentation of the amplifier that it wasn't that long ago that people that lived up here around the Great Lakes could not have an amplifier on 160, and now, of course, we can. And the reason is really due to GPS's proliferation. With the I, satellites I, and GPS now, you know, the old uh, systems of Loran are pretty much gone. And uh, the Coast Guard was was really responsible for Loran. I remember, uh, uh, I don't know if we can see this. Oh, pretty yeah. Pretty hard to tell. But, uh, but that was the United States Coast Guard uh, Loran station at Nantucket. And their, wow. uh, their, yeah, their theme was the power behind the pulse, uh, Gordo. So that was kind of <laughs> cool in those days. Well, anyhow, the, um, uh, the video is ready, and it's about programming radios. So uh, with that, George, I think we're set. Last time, we were talking a lot about digital modulation techniques and choosing a radio. This time, let's assume you've kind of chosen a radio, and now you want to get it on the air and you want to get it programmed. And I hear a lot of questions on the air about programming, so programming is kind of today's topic. Remember now, things have really changed in D-Star. We're at the fourth generation of D-Star radios at this point. And by that, I mean that the 2300 was the first, and then the 880 was the second, and the 92 portable and the 2820 mobile were kind of the third generation. And right now, we're up to the ID-51, a fabulous portable, and the ID-5100 mobile. And those are amazing radios. And those radios do a lot of the programming for you. It has become so much simpler in D-Star over time. How can we program these radios? First off, we can do it from the front panel, and the, the 5100 is really nice because a keyboard even comes up when it's appropriate and needed, so it's just like working on your cell phone or a smartphone. And then we could use a cloning uh, cable, or we can use the software, or have no cable at all and do it totally by the SD card. So there's a variety of ways that you can talk to your radio to program it. I prefer, and I know Ray uh, uh, N9JA also prefers to use the software. I really like using the software. ICOM software comes with the 5100 these days, so there's no extra charge. Now, so there are fans out there of uh, the RT Systems software, and RT Systems does make an RT51 that comes with a cable. Again, that's a great thing if you like to use it, and a lot of people do, but I'm a big fan of free, and the other software comes with the radio, and you don't even need the cable. Next, the GPS receive antenna is built into the control head. Get the control head with power on the radio out to where it can see the GPS birds. Once you have a position, you can go into the radio and simply say, what are the repeaters around me? And it writes them all into the, uh, into the memories, both for D-Star and analog now. So some real advantages with the automated functions of the radio. Next, we can do it a little more conventionally. You can use the ARRL uh, repeater book and look up the frequency pairs that you might like. Or you can get on Google and, and research frequencies that way. There's a lot of spots there that, that, are, that are really valuable, including radio reference. Uh, you can also share files with friends. I know I've I've shared files with, with, with several friends. Um, and there's help on the air. You can get on the air and talk to people and ask them, hey, I'm having this problem when I'm trying to program, or how do I make it do this? And guys are talking about that everywhere on D-Star all day long. 
Um, and some dealers even provide a little help with programming. So there's a lot of ways to get help. There's a lot of ways to program the radio. And remember, most important, the way the fourth generation radios are set up, they self-populate. This is an example of the ICOM software that comes with the radio. And it's set up with this branch over at this side that allows you to kind of see where you, where you are in the programming. And then the fields in this manner. And you basically go through and uh, get the cursor where you want the cursor to be and then use your keyboard. It's awfully easy to do it that way. And the best advantage from my point of view of this software is let's say you get into into something like down here and um, and you're you're looking at something that that you're wondering what it is for instance heterodyne a band VHF I'm not sure offhand what that is so what you do is you simply right click it and go to help and then the software brings up a well written little bit from the manual that specifically addresses your question. And it also covers the variables for that data field. This is what I really like about the ICOM software. It's so easy to use. I think the banks are one of the most creative and interesting areas of programming the radio. And the reason I think that is, there's lots of different ways to use it. A lot of people use one bank for their VHF channels and another bank for their UHF frequencies. Um, some others put their analogs in a bank and their digitals in yet another. Some people add to that their simplex uh, frequency collections for each band. And those are probably the most common ways. Other people that maybe have two locations that they visit frequently that are you know, geographically diverse, we'll set up all the frequencies for one location in a, in a set of banks and all the frequencies for the other location in still another set of bank. Now, what I like to do is even a little different from all of that. I have my own way of using it. I like to use the radio for what the radio really can do. Uh, so, here's what I do on mine. My banks are labeled Air, Broadcast, Commercial Radio, D-Star, food kiosks, ham, marine, police, and railroad. In other words, I like to do a lot of listening to the other services that the radio covers. And that gives me some real opportunities and lets me have a lot more fun with my radio. Here's how. Hi, welcome to Burger King. How may I help you? Yeah, Okay, now we know what she just ordered at Burger King. <laughs> How empty can W8SS's life be to listen to things like this. Hey, you'd be surprised how much fun it is to sit and eat your meal and watch cars come up and predict before they order what they might order. No kidding, it's fun. So one day while driving along uh, with D-Star on the main band and the sub band turned to the Marine Bank and scanning, we heard an interesting Coast Guard call, and we decided it was only about 50 miles away, so let's go see it. Hey, Griffin, uh, we're just about clear there now. Turns out what we saw was the freighter, the Ashtabula. That uh, is a 1,004-foot-long ship, 7,200 horsepower. It's a barge with an attached tug, the Defiance, and she was stuck in the ice. That's right. It was in Marine City, Michigan, in the St. Lawrence Seaway on the St. Clair River, stuck in the ice. And the Coast Guard called three ships to its rescue, three icebreakers, the Canadian Griffin, the Canadian Samuel Reesley, and good old number 102, the Bristol Bay of the United States Coast Guard. You're understood. Reesley, on your mark. This is that. Here goes the Reesley. Uh, stand by there. Well, they worked and worked. They got her loose, and then they continued to uh, stay with her and guide her as she continued uh, downbound uh, through Lake Erie into Buffalo with 26,000 tons of sand on board. But wait a minute. What about D-Star? Let's listen to an amateur radio D-Star QSO. This is WB6 AEA monitoring on the reflector. WB6 AEA. This is W8SS. Uh, how are you today? 
just fine. I see from the uh, display that your name is Joe. The name here is John, Juliet Oscar November, and I'm located in the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm located in Hell, Michigan, uh, where it is currently 4 degrees Fahrenheit. I see you're using a 5100. I am as well. Really love this radio. Uh, I've owned the 5100 for exactly a week. I had a, an ID 880 that I just couldn't get my head around, and uh, the 5100 is making all the difference in the world for me on D-Star. Okay, well, that's enough for this evening, Ham Nation enthusiasts. Lots planned for next time, including call sign routing, using reflectors, DPRS, and much more, including explaining what this screen behind us is about. 73, until next time. Nice, Joe. Well, thank you very much. We're trying to keep it fun for everybody and uh, kind of put some effort into it. Oh, yeah, that, that was great. Guess what I got this week? I got one of these hey. right here, uh, a new ID 51A. 51. And, boy, I'm having fun with it. This is one of the 50th anniversaries. Uh, I'm so fortunate that you tested it in the fish pool last week, so <laughs> I don't have to. Good. <laughs> Excellent, yeah. Actually, that was uh, that was the radio right before that that I tested the ninety two. But uh, uh, I'll tell you that fifty one is really nice. Big advantages in the fifty one. It's so much easier to program, and I really really like all the extra features. And as you use that radio, as you're well aware, you know it just does so much more. It speaks to you. It shows you more. It's really a great radio. It, it really is. You know, I've uh, I've only used uh, ID eight eighty H before and. A world of difference between the early generation of D-Star and these these newer models like uh, this uh, 51 Handy Talkie and the 5100 you've got there. Big, big improvements. Well, we'll see you again soon, Joe. Let's go to Don now and see what's going on in the news this week. No, that's a large pizza, and I'd, I'd like extra <laughs> Canadian bacon on that if I possibly could. Okay? Over? Oh, oh, we're on. Sorry, let me turn this. Yeah, the fifty one's amazing. I mean, I, you know, I'm probably not close enough to to the pizza place to order my pizza, but nonetheless, so I'll give it a shot. I used to. It's <laughs> you have a lot of fun listening to the fast food stuff. It's uh, it's amazing. You know what? I used to I used to have fun back in the days of analog uh, analog cell phones or not cell phones, but analog um, cordless phones. They were on forty six and forty nine megahertz. Mm -hmm. About the time about the time that the kids would come home from school, mm -hmm. I'd swing that six meter beam around and pick up all those cordless phones, and I would hear all the crap that little Johnny did at school that his dad was going <laughs> to beat his behind about. Oh my god! Oh, it was funny, funny stuff, funny stuff. All right, well, let's get into the news of the week from Amateur Radio Newsline, and we've got the solar forecast from Doctor Scove who uh, did this one just specifically for us. I didn't have to edit this one down. She's been a little under the weather of late, so uh, we thank Dr. Sko for doing that. And we'll have some info on uh, the Young Ham of the Year Award coming up after the Newsline piece. From Amateur Radio Newsline Report, number 1,952, these are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, February 18th, 2015. Disaster Relief Services with assistance from Radio Amateurs is providing emergency communications in the wake of the erupting Fuego Volcano in the Republic of Guatemala. The largest eruption in three years took place on Saturday, February 7th, and sent a cloud of ash skyward that forced the closure of the La Aurora International Airport. Tourists who were hiking on the volcano and those living in nearby villages had to be evacuated. The Club of Amateur Radio of Guatemala activated emergency station Tango Golf Zero Alpha Alpha. Tango Golf Zero Alpha Alpha has established a network with reporting stations located in neighboring coastal Costa Rica, Mexico, Honduras, Cuba, and Venezuela. A 2-meter repeater on 147.015 megahertz is also in use. Authorities have already been put in the area on alert and had issued instructions urging people to take shelter, wear masks, cover water tanks, and be aware of evacuation routes. Local experts expect the emergency to ease and to allow a cleanup of the area to begin. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Fred Vobie, W8HDU in Lima, Ohio. A super high frequency ham radio band here in the United States could be in peril due to spectrum needed for vehicular radar systems. Skeeter Nash in 5ASH has more. 
The FCC is seeking comment on issues involving expanded use of various radar applications in the 76 to 81 gigahertz band, which amateur radio shares with other services. The band, from 77.5 to 78 gigahertz, is allocated to the amateur and amateur satellite services on a primary basis and to the radio astronomy and space research services on a secondary basis. Among many issues, the FCC seeks comment on the possibility of reallocating the amateur radio and amateur satellite services from 76 to 81 gigahertz, and it asks for suggestions on alternative spectrum that it might make available in this general region. The FCC Notice of Proposed Rulemaking and Report and Order is in response to a petition for rulemaking designated RM-11666 that was filed in 2012 by Robert Bosch, LLC. Two petitions for reconsideration of the Commission's 2012 report and order addressing vehicular radar systems in the 76 to 77 gigahertz band were incorporated at earlier proceedings. The FCC says its goal is to adopt rules that address amateur use, including amateur satellite use, within the 76 to 81 gigahertz band in a comprehensive and consistent manner. Mark down April 18th on your calendar. It's a red-letter date for amateur radio worldwide, as we hear from Jim Davis, W2JKD. The theme of World Amateur Radio Day 2015 will be the International Telecommunications Union and the International Amateur Radio Union celebrating 150 years of advancing the Telecommunications Act. Each year, on April the 18th, radio amateurs celebrate World Amateur Radio Day, which happens to be the date way back in 1925 when the International Amateur Radio Union was founded. As such, World Amateur Radio Day activities and special events are an opportunities to spread the word about what radio amateurs are doing in the 21st century. And as this is considered to be one of amateur radio's most important annual events, several IARU member societies and associated clubs are expected to sponsor special event stations on the weekend to mark the occasion. Fans of W5KUB and his Dayton, Huntsville, and Last Man Standing K6H webcast will be happy to hear of his latest venture. Amateur Radio's Roundtable is a new series of Internet-distributed webcasts being produced by Tom Medlin, W5KUB, and available online over W5KUB.com. The webcast will be held Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. Central Time, which correlates to 0200 UTC on Wednesdays. According to Tom, Amateur Radio Roundtable will be an informal discussion of all aspects of ham radio with the intent of allowing viewers to watch or be a guest via Skype or Google Hangout. To simply view the webcast, you only need to take your web browser to W5KUB.com and sign in. If you wish to be an active participant, you'll first need to send an email to Tom at W5KUB.com so he can provide you with the information needed to join the show. Once again, that's the Amateur Radio Roundtable every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Central U.S. Time on W5KUB.com. And that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news for over 37 years and counting at www.arnewsline.org. For Bill Pasternak, WA6ITF, Fred Vobie, W8HDU, Skeeter Nash, N5ASH, and Jim Davis, W2JKD, I'm Don Wilbanks, AE5DW73, and we'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. And now, the solar update with Dr. Tamitha Scove. Hi, I'm Tamitha Scove with your solar storm forecast for the week of February 18th. Well, as promised, there's been very little activity on the sun this week. We're kind of in that dead zone where nothing really is happening. We did have that one solar filament that we thought was going to lift off the sun, but it's managed to hang on, and it's snaking now around the west side of the limb. We'll be monitoring that as it rotates around the backside. We also have region 2282, which is in a state of decay, and we've got a couple other regions that are trying to form, but they're really not getting there yet. The only thing we're waiting for is some of these bright regions you see that are just behind the east limb. As those rotate into view, we might see a return of activity. Switching to our M flare threat meter, you can see the last M class flare we had was back on February 10th, and it's basically plummeted since then. In the last couple days, we've been pretty much flatlined, way below the sea floor. So, you amateur radio operators and emergency responders expect that continue to continue for over the next few days until those bright regions on the east limb uh, pump up the activity again.
Returning to the disk, you can see region 2282 is rotating off of the west limb, and you have the remnants of 2284 that are kind of decaying. We do have a couple new regions that are growing. 2286 is growing, and there's a couple other new regions, but not a lot of activity right at the moment. What we're really waiting for is that bright region that's the remnants of 2279. When that rotates back onto the disk, if it has some strong magnetic complexity, it may mean that we can up the flare potential over the next few days. Switching to your solar flare and particle radiations from Outlook over the next few days, as you can see, everything is basically green. That's because we have very little activity on the Earth's side disk. NOAA has only given us about a 1% chance of an M-class flare over the next few days. And depending upon what that East Limb region does, uh, if it has any magnetic complexity, we might see a, an increase in the flare potential to 5 maybe 10% uh, near the end of the week. But uh, you amateur radio operators, you shouldn't have any issues with the bands due to flares this week. So the past couple of days have given us a really nice dose of aurora pretty much all over the world. And that's come from that grazing solar storm blow along with that enhanced fast wind uh, that should be waning now in the next 24 hours or so. Along with that, we have very little activity on the Earth-facing disk right now in terms of flares. So pretty much enjoy the quiet over the next few days. At least until that east limb region begins to rotate into earth view and we get a better look at it to see whether or not it has any magnetic complexity at all. If that's the case, then activity might start ramping up again. I'm Tamitha Scove. Thank you for watching. Good stuff. Thanks, Doc. Uh, she's, she's not been feeling well. Uh, in fact, her and, and her little daughter have both been sick lately, so you should uh, definitely follow her on Twitter at Tamitha Scove, and uh, if you feel like it, maybe, maybe uh, tell her how much you like uh, her uh, solar updates here on Ham Nation, and maybe maybe send her a get well wish as well. I'm sure she would appreciate that. So uh, anyway, uh, good stuff. Now, back to Newsline and the Young Ham of the Year Award. No, we did not have one last year. And I saw tonight on Facebook, Bill Pasternak posted that the nominating period is open now for the Young Ham of the Year Award. You go to arnewsline.org and along the top you click on the Y-H-O-T-Y button there on the banner and that will take you to the nominating form and further info for the Young Ham of the Year Award. So hopefully we'll, we'll have a, uh, a deserving Young Ham of the Year that we'll, uh, we'll present in Huntsville, Alabama coming up in August. But right now Let's uh, have a word from these folks right here. Yes, it's ICOM. Take it away, From new ICOM. models to classic radios, there's something for everyone this season. So get out or hunker down with ICOM. Celebrate ICOM's 50th year with the IC7850. Only 150 units are available, and each radio features 1.2 kilohertz optimized roofing filter, a new local oscillator design with improved phase noise, several spectrum scope enhancements, and distinct gold accents on the front panel and commercial commemorative label. For contesters just starting out this year, ICOM's IC7600. You get advanced DSP technology and IF roofing filters, dual watch on the same band on an ultra-wide 5.8-inch display. Got cabin fever and need to get away? Get mobile with ICOM's IC2730A and ID5100A. The analog 2730A mobile and digital 5100A with built-in GPS. Both feature optional Bluetooth capability for hands-free operation, 50 watts output power on both V. UHF and UHF, and the large backlit screen. For entry-level D-Star operation, take the ID-880H on the road. Features include a good menu structure and VHF-UHF dual-band functionality, one band at a time. To hunker down or get out, the ID-51A Plus is a perfect radio to enjoy global communications. This dual-bander has the free downloadable RSMS-1A Android app, enhanced DV functionality, and additional D-Plus reflector link commands. Make sure you visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information on ICOM's base stations, mobiles, and portables. And you can tune in and enter to win after each episode of Ham Nation. Go to icomamerica.com slash ham nation. Throw your name in the hat for some great swag prizes like T-shirts and hats. And learn how you could win the monthly grand prize drawing for a new radio. And while you're at icomamerica.com slash hamnation, you can find the official rules and check out all the previous drawing winners. Uh, for the February, the grand prize is going to be this right here, the ID51A+. Plus. It'll be uh, the plus model. It won't have the, the color on here, but it'll be the same radio. Uh, it's 5-watt dual band, dual watch, uh, handy talkie with 
D-Star, integrated GPS, automatic repeater list up, and a lot more. So go to iComamaria.com slash Ham Nation after this episode and each episode of Ham Nation. Sign up and good luck. And don't forget to follow ICOM on Facebook and Twitter. And now it's time for Smoke and Solder. And you know, the Raspberry Pi Foundation just released the brand new Raspberry Pi 2 Model B. And I got one uh, a week or so back and played with it a little bit this week. So let's take a look. This week on Smoke and Solder, we're going to talk a little bit about a new model of Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi 2 Model B is a second generation Raspberry Pi and it's replacing the original Raspberry Pi 1 Model B and B+. It still retails for just $35. Compared to the Raspberry Pi 1, it's got a 900 MHz quad-core ARM version 7 Cortex-A7 CPU and 1 GB of RAM. The upgrade in the CPU means that you'll see approximately two times performance increase just because of the processor upgrade alone. For software that can take advantage of multi-core processors, you'll get an average of four times the performance, but for really multi-thread friendly code, up to 7.5 times increase in speed. And that's not even considering the one gig of RAM, which will greatly improve many programs and your web browser experience. Like the Pi 1 Model B Plus, you also get four USB ports, 40 GPIO pins, full HDMI port, an Ethernet port, combined 3.5 millimeter audio jack and composite video, a camera interface, a display interface, a micro SD card slot, video core 4 3D graphics core, and it's physically the same size and the same connectors as the Model B Plus, so it should work with most existing daughter boards and cases. Because it has an ARM version 7 processor, it can run a full range of ARM GNU Linux distributions, including Snappy Ubuntu Core. And Microsoft has announced there'll be a version of Windows 10 for free to support Internet of Things applications. The Raspberry Pi 2 has an identical form factor to the previous Pi 1 Model B Plus and is said to have complete compatibility with Raspberry Pi 1. Although the documentation that comes with the Raspberry Pi Model 2B says a minimum of 600 milliamps is required from the 5 volt supply, a 1.2 amp power supply from a reputable retailer should be enough to power your Raspberry Pi. Typically the Model B uses between 700 milliamps and 1 amp depending on what peripherals are connected. The micro SD card should be a name brand device with at least four gigs of storage rated for class C or faster. The faster micro SD cards will provide faster operation depending on what you're doing with your Pi. The HDMI connector is compatible with most HDMI monitors and television sets and an HDMI to DV adapter will work with many DVI monitors. Most any standard USB keyboard and mouse will work but you need to be aware that some draw more current than the others and may require a powered USB hub for proper operation. The Ethernet port allows networking your Pi to the outside world with a standard Cat5 cable. At first glance, you may think that composite video is no longer available. However, it's been moved to the mini plug that also supplies the audio output. And be aware that the new processor on the Pi 2 means that you'll need to upgrade your existing micro SD card or create a new micro SD card with your operating system. You can't plug an older SD card from a Pi 1 into a Pi 2 unless you upgrade it first using sudo space apt-get space upgrade on your Pi 1 first. Also, any pre-compiled software should work with the new Pi 2, but it won't run at full speed, so you should recompile your software for the new processor. Now, I wanted some kind of rough benchmark just to see how much faster the Pi 2 might be. So, on the left-hand side is the Pi 2. You can see the four raspberries at the top of the screen indicate the quad core. On the right-hand side of the screen is my original Raspberry Pi Model 1B. I, I never had a B+. Plus. So, left-hand side, 24 seconds on the Raspberry Pi 2B. I counted from the time that I started until I saw the CPU gauge reach zero. We're still going over on the original B. Now while we're waiting on it to complete, let's just take a look at 
loading a web page here. I decided just to see how quick that would load. And I've got to say, I believe it's considerably faster than previous versions of the Raspberry Pi. As you can see, the Hamnation website loaded up pretty quickly here. So overall, I think we're going to see a much better experience out of the Raspberry Pi 2 Model B. Now over to the original B. Looks like it's going to be 1 minute and 15 <laughs> seconds just to get completely booted up. Is the Raspberry Pi 2B worth the upgrade? I'd have to say definitely. So there you go. I'm, I'm seeing much better performance with it. I have not done a lot yet. I've only installed the Raspberry operating system and played with some of the apps that are on there, but uh, really encouraging. I, I would say, yeah, now it's ready for prime time. And that Windows 10 is not going to be, you know, like Windows 10 Professional. It's going to be a special version of Windows 10 for Internet of Things applications, which the Raspberry Pi uh, would fit nicely into that category. Well, you know, last week um, I asked a question, how did Joe Mesh test his handy talkie? And uh, most everybody knew the answer to that, but we could only have one winner, and that lucky winner was John Davis, uh, WA8YXM, and he said Joe tested his ICOM underwater, and it worked too. So congratulations, Don. You're going to win this microphone I'm speaking in right here, the Howl PR781G. Nice microphone. I had never played with one up until last week's show. I pulled it out, and I wanted to get a chance to run it here two weeks before I gave it away. So sadly, it's got to go to John now, but I know he's going to be real happy with it. For next week, the question is going to be, in my Raspberry Pi, I've installed a DV3000 board. What does that do? And I'll give you a little hint. If you go look at uh, the Amateur Logic we just released this week, you'll see what that board did. But uh, what we're going to give away is another copy of Morse Code Breaking the Barrier by Dave Finley, N1IRZ, a great book from MFJ. If you'd like to win that, well, you know the question. What is that uh, DV3000 board doing in my Raspberry Pi? Send the answer to me at hamnationcontestgmail.com, and you could be next week's lucky winner. Well, let's get in Val now and see what's been going on up in the north there. Hi, Val. Well, good evening, George and Don and Gordo and Joe, and uh, good video, Joe. Uh, nice job there. Uh, well, let's go ahead and get right into upcoming DX. I know I've been a little remiss on this with the whole K1N thing, so you want to start showing the, those slides, Brian. Uh, there's the upcoming DX I'm going to be talking about now. First one up on the rolls is uh, Coco's Island, if you want to go to the next slide. And that is the TI-9. Now, they only have a permit. It's it's a little island off the coast of Costa Rica. They only have a seven-day permit, and they've been active for a few days, so you probably only have about four more days to get those guys in the log. And the next DX is Western Sahara. They're going to be there until the end of the month. Uh, the Western Sahara Radio Club is going to be uh, active on the air. Also, the next one coming up, and this is going to be the 20th through March 6th, and that's Guantanamo Bay in Cuba, KG5HF and kg 4 Whiskey Victor are going to be on the air. So if you need Gitmo, you better get on the air and work them then. And uh, finally, we have uh, Robinson Crusoe Island, which is the second largest island part of the Juan Fernandez DX entity. And that's three golf, uh, Oscar Zulu Charlie. Um, and that is going to be the 24th through March 4th. And then for you IOTA chasers, uh, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that name, but that is... Um, off near Rio de Janeiro, and that's Zulu Victor 1 Mike, and that is SA, which stands for South America, 029, IOTA number SA029. So uh, go ahead and get out there and uh, get some of that DX or IOTA in the logbook. Now, I wanted to also talk to you guys about um, K1N just ended, and since I was in the group uh, with the pilots, on what was going on. Uh, a lot of the chatter going on was some new DXers uh, need a little bit of help with the basics. So I'm going to kind of show you really quickly some of the basics 
to working some of the more rare DX. And we're going to go ahead and start with the video I did of my favorite cluster, and that is DX Summit. Now, there's a lot of clusters out there, DX Watch, DX Heat. But the reason I like DX Summit is it lists all the country codes there in the right column. See, I don't have all the prefixes memorized, so it works out really nice. It also has filters, so I can pick what to include. Say I have a, a three-element tri-bander and I want to work phone. I can go ahead and click 14, 21, and 28 megahertz and then go ahead and hit my set filters. And it's only gonna give me spots that apply to what I can work. Um, you also have up in the corner there, the search bar. I can put in a DX entity or a call sign. So let's go ahead and put in K1N. And it's gonna list all the K1N spots for those uh, three bands. But let's go ahead and eliminate that. And let's put in um, seven, mega, seven megahertz or 40 meters and see what pops up. Now do you see, K1N is spotted there on 70, I can't quite read that, but 7095, something like that, 93. Um, but hey, wait a minute, I can't transmit there, but you really don't need to be concerned with where they're spotted. What you want to look in is that, that info and see where they're QSXing or listening. And they, they, they're, they're working people on 7185. So you tech, so you generals and extras can work them there because you can work all the way down to 7185 or 7175. Although you want never want to go that low. You want to stay about 7178 and allow three kilohertz for the signal, your signal width. So you don't transmit below 7175. So let's go ahead and do this on the radio here, my radio. I do have a dual receive radio. Works out really nice when you're DXing and contesting. Now, some of you might not have that. You might just have um, one VFO on your radio and you have to hold another button down to uh, switch to your second VFO. But let's, assuming you have a dual radio, you're going to go ahead and go to 7 megahertz and let's do 7095, like I think the cluster spotted, if they were still active on the air. We're just going to pretend now. And you're going to go ahead and hit your split button. And then I'm going to make sure VFOA and VFOB, which is VFOA, VFOB, and I can listen on VFOA and VFOB here. So I'm going to go ahead and make A equals B, because look at that's on uh, 14 megahertz. You can also probably see up there a little easier. So I'm going to make them equal. Now I'm going to set this to where they're listening. They're listening on 7185. So let's go ahead and get up there. Whoops. All right. So now if once I hit the transmit button, I'll be transmitting on 7085, but listening on 7095. And they're going to be doing the opposite, obviously. Now, another thing that you might want to do, say they're listening on 7185 through 7200. And say you're not running a lot of power. If you're running a lot of power, you might as well stick to their band edges, 7185 or 7200. And you'll probably get through, muscle through the pileups easily. But if you're working QRP or 100 watts, you're going to want to go and hide in the middle here somewhere and look for where there's not a signal. If you have a scope, it works out handy. If not, you can put the dual watch on. I'm going to hit the dual watch. Now I can listen to both frequencies at the same time since I have a dual receive radio. So there's my 7095 I'm listening to. Now I'm going to listen to 7185 or keep going up and find an empty spot and go in in there and once you find that empty spot, start transmitting and they will find you as long as it's in that range of where they're listening. Another thing people had questions on is when they'd say up JA. Um, so if you wanna go ahead and show that next graphic, Brian, these are, it's, you don't have to memorize all the country code prefixes, but these are some of the abbreviations you should know. This is pretty standard for rare DX. They'll either say, JA only, NA only, and so I'm going to put this on the wiki page, but these abbreviations uh, you should try and memorize or print it off and have in front of you. So I will put that on the wiki page uh, later tonight, and that our wiki page, for those of you who don't know, is uh, wiki.twit.tv slash wiki slash ham underscore nation. I'll also post it in the uh, chat room for any of you that want to know where that wiki page is. And uh, that's about all I have for tonight. Hopefully this little uh, tutorial will help you guys get on the air and work some DX. And next I'm going to send it over so we can to my favorite candy store and let's see what's uh, 
they have uh, going on at DX Engineering. I got all kinds of stuff at DX Engineering, but I want to talk about something in particular, something that um, will, will help you tremendously when you're trying to get these, these uh, far away DX stations in your log, and that is a linear. And tuners, the tuner particularly. A few weeks ago, we talked about the critical role that antenna tuners play in optimizing station performance. Now, there are a ton of tuner options out there, and it's very important to make sure you have the right one for your station. DX Engineering carries several models from a company that is practically synonymous with Antuner, anten Antuner Tenna Innovation, Antenna Tuner Innovation, that too, and it's Palstar. And all of the Palstar tuners that we're going to talk about are made right here in the USA with rugged components that long-lasting reliability. And here are some of the highlights. The AT5K is amazing. They call it the rock crusher, and there's a really, really good reason. So suppose you're running legal limit. Uh, you know, some antenna tuners have a hard time. This thing will handle 3,500 watts of single-tone continuous power with hardly any loss. The tuner can even handle up to 5,000 watts in certain impedance ranges. The AT5K covers... Uh, 1.8 to 22 megahertz with uh, increased limited tuning all the way to 29.5 megahertz. It also has two custom large plate variable capacitors and ceramic body variable inductor housed in a durable chassis. You're not going to burn this thing down, that is for sure. It, it, because it's fan cooled, give you uh, long service life and it'll handle both balanced line feeds and unbalanced coax feed. So no matter what kind of antenna you're running, it will do it. All the specs are at dxengineering.com. Palstar also has launched the next generation of full legal power antenna auto tuners with the HF auto antenna tuner. It'll handle 1,800 watts, but can tune with only 2 watts. So you QRP guys can use this as well. The HF auto covers 1.8 to 54 megahertz, can tune within seconds. It has a large bat -lit, backlit LCD screen, gives you your RF power, SWR frequency, and a whole lot more. Quiet, continuous, variable components help deliver the perfect antenna match. There are a lot more antenna tuner options as well, including RF matching networks and differential tuners available from Palstar. You can see all the varieties that they have at DX Engineering. Just visit dxengineering.com and uh, check out the Palstar stuff. You'll also find more specs and compare models to ensure the perfect match. <laughs> yeah, pun intended for your station. It's dxengineering.com. I want you to go there now. dxengineering.com slash hamnation. DX Engineering ships faster than anyone else in the industry. If you get your order in by 10 p.m. Eastern tonight and it's in stock, it'll be on your truck headed your way tonight. Proven products, expert advice, and the beta price guarantee. DX Engineering, helping you shrink the globe. Grab your catalog, shop online 24-7. dxengineering.com slash hamnation. Thank you so much for your support of DX Engineering. We do appreciate it. Now let's go see what's going on in the chat room with our good friend, Amanda. Hey, good evening, everybody. And um, great show tonight. First, uh, Val, thank you so much for some of your tips. I, I personally appreciate it. And I just have to say, you know, since you worked, what, K1N on five bands, six bands, 20 bands? Uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, uh, I was just wondering, after you hearing kind of the chaos going on, uh, I was hoping maybe uh, more people have learned how to work split now. What do you think? You know what? Even uh, the seasoned pro accidentally forgets to hit the split button. Um, so... But the ones that call continuously, even though every uh, the police are telling them, the cops are telling them to move up. Um, whenever there's rare DX, just automatically assume it's split and, and go listen to where the pile up. And if you have a scope, you're going to see where the pile up is in there. Um, but yeah, it it's, I mean, I think, I know I didn't know how to do any of this stuff. And my only way I learned how was to listen. This is not on your general test, your extra test. None of this is on there. So you just have to learn uh, by getting out there and just listening before you even transmit and figuring out what's going on. But uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was, the QRMing was not as bad, I thought, on K1N as it was on Amsterdam Island. So uh, things were, seemed to be better. 
that's that's good. And um, you know what? I was one of those. I didn't transmit on the wrong frequency, but I did transmit when they were asking for Europe only. So I'm really sorry, you guys. I did that once without listening. And um, anyhow, then I stood by, obviously, and had to wait another hour and a half. But finally got them. Anyhow, uh, thanks, Val, for all your tips tonight. We really appreciate that. Uh, after that, let's see, George, um, with the upcoming, and we know that you made an ISS, SSTV, you copied their transmission. Can you, again, repeat what software you use since they're coming up on the 21st so more people can uh, download that and uh, get some photos from the ISS? Well, I hope that I get this right because I don't do a lot of slow scan, but <laughs> MMSSTV, I believe, is the package that I use. Uh, just do a search for MMSSTV, and you'll find it easily enough. And it's very simple to use, and it auto-detects which of the formats they're using, so you don't even have to worry about that. Very good. And um, so far, I've only managed to copy partial pictures, so I really hope I get a full... Uh, um, I can't think of it, but I hope I get a full transmission from them uh, from start to be from beginning to end. Anyhow, um, with that, you guys, uh, we were we had a video on tonight talking about remote bases, so that brought up a very good question. This is going to go out to all of you guys. We'll send it uh, in order. So we'll go to Don first. Don, how do you feel about remote bases? Uh, are using a remote station and getting DXCC on that? Do you think that that should be allowed or do you think it should count? What do you think? You know, I don't know. That's an interesting question. Uh, and it's one that I've actually thought about a little bit. Um, I don't know that just speaking personally myself, I don't know that I would try to try to uh, try to get my DXCC remotely using a mega station. Um, I think I would rather do it just myself with my 100 watts in my my wire antenna or whatever I have at my home station. But um as long as it's within the rules, you know, you, you have to you have to operate within the rules that are in effect at the at the time that you're operating. And so that's uh, you know, it's it's kind of like going back to the whole, well, you know, you're a no code extra. Well, OK, I'm a no code extra. They, they dropped the code. I got my extra after they dropped the code. That's no that doesn't make me a better or a, or a lesser ham than someone who had to pass the code. 50 years ago, you know, and draw out circuits and everything. You work within the system that is in place at the time that you're working. So if it's legal and it's allowable, then uh, why not? But as for me, myself personally, I probably would not do it. And MMSS TV is great. I've used it forever. That's a great, great program. They also have MM uh, TTY, I believe, or MMR TTY. They, they, he does a, a RIDI program as well. So uh, that's that's all good stuff. That MM software is all really good stuff, and it's all free. Okay, and that's was going to be my next question. Is it free? So, all right. Thanks uh, so much, Don. And uh, happy Mardi Gras. Is that how you say that? Is there any other special term to say happy Mardi Gras? Yeah, but you have to be drunk to say most of the other ones. Oh, I haven't had enough <laughs> hurricanes then. Okay. Uh, George, what do you think about the, re the remote uh, station? I don't know the official rules on that, so I, I'm not really sure how to answer. Just right off the cuff, I'd say no, it doesn't doesn't um, sound exactly valid to me. I mean, that would kind of like maybe getting your DXCC using D-Star and Echo Link, which, uh, you know, just, just doesn't seem exactly right either. I think the challenge is in working RF, you know, strictly RF from... From your station, I mean, that's, to me, it seems like what you're trying to do is prove uh, your skills and your equipment, not necessarily somebody else's that you're connected to over the Internet. But I could be wrong on that. Um, yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure what the rules are either. I just kind of ask in your personal opinion what you thought about it. Uh, my opinion also is I'm not sure... That's like, I think personally, I wouldn't want to make skeds with people to get my work doll states, but other people do like the person sitting in the room next door did that. So, <laughs> um, I, I don't hold anybody like to say that they're worse of an operator or anything. So it just wasn't my personal preference, but let's go to Val, but we can't ask Val because she's actually probably at basically a remote station that everybody would want to operate from. So what do you think, Val? I think as long as you're in the same zone, uh, that it's okay. 
Um, I think because propagation changes so much from east coast to west coast, north to south, uh, it would, it, you know, the west coast has a lot, it's easier time working Asia, whereas the east coast has a lot easier time working Europe. So you can't have both, you can't have, <laughs> you can't have your cake and eat it too, you know. So I think right. as long as you're in the same ITU zone, um, I think, um, I think it's good. Okay. That's an interesting thought. I never thought of it that way. So that's pretty cool. And yeah, thinking about if you're trying to make 50 states on 160, um, yeah, that might come in handy, maybe. Um, all right. Thanks uh, for your guys' answers. I appreciate that. And uh, just one more question. I'll send this over to George as well. Uh, George, are, do you know of any makes of any radios coming out that are going to host all digital modes for an all-in-one, kind of like your Epson printer, scan, copy, fax, print, all that good stuff? Anything? Mm, I don't know of any at this point. I know uh, there's some talk about a handy talkie out there that's going to do several different digital modes. It's It's been talked about it for several years, but I've never seen one in the wild yet. So uh, at the current time, no, I, there's nothing out there that I'm aware of. Um, is it possible in the future? Maybe. I don't know. We'll just have to wait and see. It, it's mostly a matter of the software because they're all using that Ambi Kodak in there. Exactly. And I've always uh, been wary of uh, an all-in-one, by the way, because if you look at your printer and it's an all-in-one, they usually crap out in what, three months, five months, if you're lucky. So you have to be careful of those. Um, so sometimes it's okay to have separate is my personal opinion again. So, hey, you guys, uh, great questions tonight. I have a couple of um, upgrades and new licensee announcements, and then we'll move on. Uh, KG5 FBC, 12 years old, got his technician license. Congrats. And KE0 DBM, Derek also got his technician license. And upgrade, Marty KC1 CWF, upgraded to general this last week. So, yeah, you guys, uh, congrats to you. Uh, so with that, Hey, that's all I've got tonight. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I don't know who's closing up tonight, so I'll send it to uh, Don. Take it away. All right. We've had fun tonight. We've had a good show. We've learned a lot about D-Star. We've uh, learned some stuff about the sun. We've learned a lot about DXing. And, uh, man, this is just this is what it's all about. And also, I got to check in to the 20-meter net earlier. They're on uh, 14266. So you might want to go check that out. George, you know the uh, other uh, frequencies and the, uh, and the digital uh, digital net locations? Um, I don't know. I haven't noticed them in the chat room tonight, but that's a good info there on the 20 meter net. I need to check that out before the band changes. 80 meters, you can catch Cheryl on 3847. Uh, 40 meters is going to be somewhere around 72, 78, plus or minus a little bit. Just kind of scan that area a little bit and you'll find it. D star reflector 14 module C and if you don't have a D-Star radio, you can listen to that at hamnationdstar.net. And we've got Echo Link on Star to drop in Star node number 355-800. Val, before we go, any final words? Uh, yeah, I noticed a question in the chat room I did want to address. When you are working DX on split, you want to log the DX frequency or the frequency that you operated on. So if it's 7095 listening on 7185, you're going to want to log 7185. Otherwise, it looks like you were out of band or out of your privileges. And I think that's all I have tonight. Uh, everybody stay warm and uh, check on your neighbors. Uh, I know we have uh, serious wind chill factors going on here, and uh, I think it's uh, pretty much hitting most of the country. Yeah, good information, Val. I was thinking right the opposite. You would log the uh, the DX station's frequency, but that makes good good sense there. Yeah, because they could yeah. be transmitting at a portion that you're not able to. Mm. So uh, good information. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. Another great show. Bob is going to be back with us next week. Looking forward to seeing him again. And I guess that does it. For here, I know everybody in the country is cold this week. It's really been a cool one here. So we'll say 7-3. Catch you again next week. 7-3. Good night, everyone. Bye.